In this video, we're going to look at the process whereby monomers are turned into polymers. And in this first example, we're going to look at something called addition polymerization. Polymerization is the process of forming polymers from monomers, and this particular type of reaction is an addition reaction. So on the left hand side, we see a molecule called chloroethene. Chloro for chlorine, ethene for the ethene monomer. And in effect, what we need to do in order to form the polymer is find a way of breaking one of the double bonds between the two carbons. If we can break one of those carbon bonds, then each of those carbon atoms will have a free electron to react with another chloroethene molecule. So let's remove one of those bonds. And in its place, we'll have two free electrons. So we'll have a free electron on the left-hand carbon, and we'll have a free electron on the right-hand carbon. Now, once we've done that, each of those carbons will be free to connect to another carbon to form the backbone of our polymer. Now, the way that we break one of those bonds in the double bonds is using something called a catalyst or an initiator. And in effect, it's a highly reactive particle which will attack that double bond and break that double bond, freeing up those electrons in the carbons. So the initiator or the catalyst breaks those bonds and we get what we see on the right hand side, which is our PVC polymer. So this process of bond breaking and bond making will continue until the catalyst or the initiator is no longer available. So what we can do is allow this reaction to take place until we have a carbon backbone of the required length. So we end up with carbons, hydrogens and chlorines on alternate carbons. OK, so this process can continue for as long as there's a catalyst available. What this means is we can dictate the length of those chains and we can start and stop that reaction as and when we require. The reason this is called addition polymerization is because we're adding one chloroethene molecule to another and nothing is being lost. Nothing is being removed from the process. All we're doing is adding the monomers together end on end. Let's look at a slightly different reaction. And this one is called condensation polymerization. So already this type of polymerization already looks more complex, but the reason for that is because the two molecules that we're bonding together here are much larger. In the top left hand corner, we have something called an amine and amines include these nitrogen groups here and on the left hand side here. This particular one is called hexamethylene diamine. So we have a very large molecule. We see a backbone consisting of six carbon atoms plus the two nitrogens, one on either end. Now to that we're going to add an acid, and the acid we're going to add is called adipic acid. Here we see a backbone of four carbons, but we also have these oxide and hydroxide groups on the left and right hand ends. But what we're interested in is how these combine to form a new polymer. And what happens is here we have something called a condensation reaction, condensation polymerization. At the moment, although we have these two large molecules, neither of them are polymers. One of them is an amine, one of them is an acid, and we want to join them to form a polymer. Now condensation means the loss of something. In this case, it's going to be the loss of water. When things condense, water is removed, but it could just as easily be the loss of ammonia in various other polymerization reactions. But here we're going to lose water. So minus H2O. We're expecting to see water lost here. And the way that the water's lost, if we refer to our amine first of all, is this hydrogen here is going to bond with this hydroxide here. So we've got H and we've got OH combined to give H2O. So if H2O is lost, what will we be left with? Well, let's remove our water molecule now. So we're going to lose hydrogen off of our amine, and we're going to lose hydroxide off of our acid. We're going to be left with a free electron here on the nitrogen, which is keen to bond, and we're going to end up with a free electron here on the acid, which is also willing to bond. And that's exactly what these two are going to do. Now, I'm not going to draw the new molecule for this particular reaction, 
but what we'll see is a join here being joined to here. So we're going to end up with a very long polymer backbone consisting of 10 carbons and two nitrogens. Now that process can continue because if we look on the other end of our amine, we have another hydrogen. And if we had another acid molecule, we would have another hydroxide. So what we can end up with is very, very long polymer chains, providing we allow this reaction to continue. That type of polymerization is called condensation polymerization. So when all of these reactions take place and we end up with these long polymer chains, the polymer that we're producing is something you will have heard of, and this polymer is nylon. So we have a reaction between an amine and an acid, water is condensed, and we're left with nylon. So what influences whether we end up with a linear, a branched, or a cross-linked polymer? And one of the important things that will affect this is the conditions that are present during these reactions. So we can adjust things such as pressures and temperatures, and these will have an impact on how these monomers bond together, and whether we end up with linear, branched, or cross-linked polymers. Now I'm going to give you an example of how we can produce a branched polymer. So in this reaction, we have natural rubber. And rubber is a flexible elastic material, as you probably know. What we're going to do is we're going to combine this in a process known as vulcanization. And what we're going to do is we're going to add sulfur in the form of this sulfur ring, but we're also going to add heat, or we're going to apply heat, and we're also going to apply pressure. So we're changing the conditions under which this reaction is occurring. Add heat, add pressure, add sulfur. And when vulcanization happens, the rubber becomes very hard. So we end up with a hard, much more rigid, less elastic material. So what happens when this process occurs? Well, what we see, once again, is we see a carbon to carbon double bond. In the top left, we've got the monomer for natural rubber, and I've drawn a second monomer directly underneath so we can see how this link occurs. And what happens again, in effect, is our carbon to carbon bonds are broken. One of those carbon to carbon double bonds is broken here, and one is broken here. Now we know in doing so that we're going to end up with a free electron here and a free electron here that's capable of bonding. But we're also going to end up with a free electron here and a free electron here. And here's what we end up with as a result. We end up with crosslinks of sulfur. So we end up with sulfur, sulfur, and a connection here. Now we can see that the sulfurs are satisfied. We can see that each of those two carbons that now have that connection are satisfied. We do still have a carbon in the first monomer that's not satisfied, but that's going to go on and form its sulfur link with the next chain. And we also see in the bottom chain that we have a carbon that's not satisfied, but that can go on and create a sulfur link with another chain. So what we see in this instance is we've gone from a polymer that was branched and it only had a small branch. It had this CH3 group here. And now what we've ended up with instead is a cross-linked covalently bonded network. We've already mentioned that this process is known as vulcanization, but in the next tutorial, we'll explore this a little bit more. We'll look at how linear, branched, and cross-linked polymers vary in terms of their properties. And we'll also look at how that's affected by whether the polymer is amorphous or primarily crystalline.